depending on local climate, those of us human beings who are natives of North and South America were living in either gather-hunter bands, farming villages, or in cities. And we had been living in the Americas for several thousand years before the arrival of the Europeans. There were countless farming villages in the region of the future U.S. About a thousand years ago, near today's St. Louis, the city of Cahokia had a population of 20,000 persons. Before the Europeans arrived, there were a great number of cities in the New World. The Incan city of Machu Picchu was built around 1450 AD in the mountains of today's Peru. The Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan was founded in 1325 near today's Mexico City. In the decades before Europeans had accomplished their first permanent settlements in America, Europeans wandered the New World looking for plunder and taking slaves. Some expeditions were privately funded. When settlers arrived in the early 1600s, some were met by Native Americans who could already speak some English. Weber tells the story of a Native American who was taken prisoner near Boston. This person learned the sailing ways of his captors as he sailed with them many times between Europe and Mexico. He escaped several years later when he was once again near his homeland. He then taught his home people how to dress like friars and wait at the seashore to get passing ships to stop, which they could then attack. Tribe that travel. 
we just represent one family here. Every family would be self-sufficient, you know, spring through fall, doing their own planting and fishing. And then you'd live as a larger extended family in the bark style houses in the winter time. But those are usually further inland. So you, every family would have two houses that they would use. You know, and communities would be between 200 and 3,000 families. That one, that one. I am. What is this over here? It's a mortar and pestle for grinding corn or dried nuts. What area does your family live in? You make cordage from different types of plant fibers like a milkweed, a dog bane, the inner bark of a basswood tree. You take those plant fibers out and you work the plant fibers together and you work them together and that's how you get your string. So cordage, a lot of the time, was considered to be too valuable to use as a roofing for a house. How we would tie a house together would have been like a lot of hickory bark, a lot of spruce root, um, what else would you use, basswood bark. But right, you see, right, right now what I'm doing, I'm just lining up the bark, so once I have a helper, they're gonna, I'm going to have somebody go on the roof and we'll just bring the bark up there and cap it off. But once a house like this is completed, it's going to last over 10 years. With your basic repairs. The way you go about getting, bless you. The way you go about getting the bark off the trees during the spring, when the sap would run up and down the tree, you'd get a stone hatchet, cut around the bottom of the tree, cut around top, slice down the middle, and you peel your bark right off the tree. And once you get the bark off the tree, you put it up just like a shingle, and once you start at the bottom, then you overlap it all the way up to the top. Mari, Mari, watch it. Don't push the card, okay? <laughs> and then I should see our little guide. Yeah, she's showing you around the home site. Yeah. I like your dress, Mari. Thank you. Pretty. How heavy are these? She has a dress like this. Yeah. Don't touch, don't touch. Mari. Okay. <laughs> I know you're inquisitive. But, um, I don't know. She probably weighs about. 40, so the buildings that are a little different. The cattail style house, like this one here, is what most families would use spring through fall. And then the bark style is if you had to live on the coast year round, um, but usually they're further inland, three to five miles, and they're used in the winter. So, would the people normally travel a lot? Uh, like, yeah. They wouldn't necessarily have one set area where they live all the time? No. Not mo most people would have the two houses, one on the coast and one in the um, inland, three to five miles. So, their own summer house? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. How old is he? Ten months. Cute. Want to put it under there for me? Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thank you, sir. Ah! You eat it, you nasty. You nasty, nasty. Sick little boy. If you guys have questions at all, you can ask. This is smoked oyster soup, and there's mashed squash and beans in a smaller clay pot. Hey everyone, this is Tim Turner, and we're cooking here in our cooking area in some clay pots. This one here has a turkey soup in it. There's a lot of steam coming out of it. And it's boiling along in there. These are clay pots. Traditionally what you'd see Wampanoag people cooking in in the 1600s. So in this pot is a turkey soup. And in the pot over here we have 
stewed pumpkin and there's some corn in there and traditionally this is how you would have cooked in the 1600s using clay pots like this feeding sticks under the pots to cook in and there's turkey and corn and wild onions and garlic in there here is the bark home in the trees Here is a reed home and its benches and chimney. These benches are tied with twine. Bags are used for storage. Grain is ground with pestle and motor, as every farming family has done for thousands of years. So what are you making? Smoked oyster soup in the large clay pot, and there's going to be mashed squash and beans in the small one. You're second time you go by yourself. and bear skins are made in the clothing and rope and many other things. How about language? Is anybody speaking it? Well, the Wampanoag language is still being spoken. See, they were quite fortunate. They almost lost. There was only a couple speakers left. But fortunately for them, one of their tribal members, Jesse Helm is her name, actually graduated, got a master's degree in linguistics. Once she got the master's degree in linguistics, she looked at all the historical documents, including the King James Bible, which was translated in Wampanoag, and developed a curriculum on that, and actually used that all those historical documents and the Bible to develop a curriculum. Now Wampanoag is being taught. They have immersion camps. There are now children in the first time in, geez, 300 years that their first language is now Wampanoag. Every child on the planet learns cultural ways and how to do everything in life by asking why a few thousand times. Oh, dirty. Doesn't matter. It's not really doing anything with this. I'm not going to feed on it. Meat is placed here to dry.
storage bag. In my weed too over there, there's no beer or drawers. Everything would be in bags. At what age did you learn to do this? Mm, you start when you're seven or eight. When you actually do it, you might be older. It's like at the circus, lady. Depending on you as an individual. So when you really want to do it. A botanical garden at one time. Oh. So you'll see us skewing a lot of things that might be just the same. Okay. I haven't seen the orange blossoms like here. Yeah. Here are two finished bags. A basket of twine and a bear skin. Today and yesterday the bags will be much larger and we have made them. They are the actual replica of the museum's research. Grandma's earring. And a man's decorative pendant. The bad news is that smallpox and other old world diseases arrived with the first European explorers and killed 50 to 90 percent of many populations that were encountered. They also play with balls and arrows, but we're not. The total population of the American continents fell from 100 million persons in the year 1500 AD to 30 million persons by 1600. We can hardly imagine its disruptive effects on a social group and the misery of losing so many family members. The area of the future United States contained at least 5 million persons before the arrival of the Europeans, but the population shrank to just one half million by the year 1800 and one quarter million Native Americans by the year 1900. Already by 1830, few Native Americans remained in the eastern U.S. along the Atlantic coast. The Cherokee of Georgia created an alphabet, wrote a constitution, and declared themselves to be an independent nation. An 1831 Supreme Court decision suggested that the U.S. government was duty-bound to keep intruders from Cherokee land. Instead, during the 1830s, 60,000 surviving Native Americans from the southeast were forcibly marched to the Oklahoma Indian Territory. In 1838, one in ten Cherokees died along the route of the so-called Trail of Tears. The Indian removal wars then shifted to the states of the Midwestern Plains during the years 1840 to 1870. As described in Death on the Prairie, The Thirty-Year Struggle for the Western Plains by Paul I. Wellman. One day in 1889, the area of Oklahoma designated as Indian Reservation Land was instead made available to the citizens of the United States through the humongous horse race known as the Land Rush. But just 40 years later, drought and bad farming practices caused the Dust Bowl. Through a span of 100 years, which is only four generations, the nation's western frontier moved about 2,000 miles or 3,200 kilometers in total. This rate is equivalent to 20 miles per year which is 400 miles or 650 kilometers per generation. Since the central and western states typically have a width of about 400 miles, 
Each increasingly westward state represents one generation of expansion. We can envision this expansion in a sort of leapfrog manner as family after family moved just west of the previous family to obtain their own farmland. Many families who moved westward would linger a while and then move again further west. This westward expansion occurred by continuing the practice of forcing the resident natives off their own land through violent means.